Welcome to this very special event from 5 by 15 as we welcome Olivia Lang and Susie Orbach to discuss bodies, protests, gender and freedom and to celebrate Olivia Lang's new book Everybody which is out now with incredible reviews and we're very pleased to say that we do have signed copies available from our book partner New and Books so the details will be in the chat thank you so much. Um, thanks for all joining us for your support and for putting your questions into the Q&A box. I know Susie's going to try to come to as many as she can towards the end, and we're really looking forward to this conversation. Do tweet us and let us know your thoughts. And let me introduce our speakers quickly. Um, first of all, Olivia Lang. She's the acclaimed author of previous works of nonfiction, including To the River, The Trip to Echo Spring and The Lonely City and fiction work Crudo, and she is known for her writing on art, on culture and identity for all of our best loved publications, newspapers and magazines. And she's in conversation this evening with Susie Orbach, a, a psychoanalyst and writer, founder of the Women's Therapy Center in 1976, and author of many groundbreaking books, including Fat is a Feminist Issue, Bodies, In Therapy, The Unfolding Story. And both of them are fellows of the Royal Society of Literature, and we're delighted to have them both with us this evening. So put your questions in the Q&A box. I will hand over <clears> now <throat> to Susie and say the stage is all yours. Welcome. Thank you. Are we there yet? Okay. Um, Thank you very much and welcome to this evening. I was really delighted to be asked to read this book, which I would have read anyway, but um, to think about it quite deeply. So to say this, this is a capacious book is to grossly mistake its scope. It's on the one hand, it's breathless. And on the other hand, it's packed with considerable scholarship and hope. And when I was thinking about this in conversation, I realized it could take a different turn every few pages. I kept thinking, oh, I could, I, I could ask Olivia about this. I could ask Olivia about that. But in fact, I've, I've narrowed the conversation, but I know she will open it up. Now in these pages, we meet Susan Sontag, we meet Kathy Acker, we meet Freud and Reich, and Galton, Anna Mendieta, Andrea Dworkin, Desaad, Malcolm X, Bayard Rustin, Nina Simone, Justin Vivian Bond, but, and, and many other characters too, but we don't just meet them in some sort of potted history manner. We're introduced to their significance using Olivia's lens of the body and the struggle for freedom and its impossibilities. As I was reading the book, Olivia, I was thinking about our historical moment. And of course, I want to ask you about that, which I will do in a moment, and particularly why the writing of the book, which I imagine happened in the days of Trump and Brexit, how it came about. And I know that conversations with my friends were punctuated or are punctuated for the last period by reference to Weimar, which is where you go to in, in um, the beginning of the book and more contemporaneously I was thinking of the second reading of the crime and policing bill ostensibly fueled by the Met to stop Extinction Rebellion and I was thinking of Matthew Paris's pot shot in this past weekend Sunday Times against the traveler community and I was thinking of this week's decision by the U.S. Supreme Court to hear a challenge to women's reproductive rights so that Roe v. Wade may be really seriously challenged. And I was thinking about the humbling of our society by COVID, the destruction of our limited democracy by the proroguing of parliament and the response to that in the Queen's speech to limit the power of the courts and the general shit show the bigots have made of our country is Jolien Morn of the Good Law Project said this week. And then there's Palestine and Israel. So. As I said, I could start anywhere, but I want to start with you, your project and your process. And my question is, why this lens? Why now for you? And if I understand your project, 
it's in part about the failures of previous progressives from earlier generations, including my generation and your generation to consolidate our changes. We win and then, and this is the question that's perplexed me, we suffer what Susan Faludi has called a backlash, a retrenchment, a defeat so brutal, we can't recognize ourselves. You devote a lot of time to Reich, who for my generation of fledgling Marxist feminist therapists was an absolute boon to read. Here was a revolutionary psychoanalyst that we read back in the, in the 70s, early 70s, who understood the relationship of large culture, class and capital and gender, who made a story, a theory about why we were the way we were, how the outside made us inside and how our insides made living so damn difficult. You follow Reich's journey from revolutionary analyst to traumatized man, to an incarcerated man who ends up in the same jail as Malcolm X. And yet Reich turns away from the political and prefigures the kind of individualism that has ended up with Gwyneth Paltrow's goop and the body as a canvas. So I'd like to ask you, um, why now, why this book? Why, why starting with Reich? Susie, I think you've summed it up. I mean, <laughs> why now? Because we're in a shit show. And the, sh the shit show continues, but the particular shit show that I was writing into or that I felt compelled to write this book from was 2015. So that's a moment at which the refugee crisis, which of course hasn't ended, but felt as if it was coming to a real crisis point. Um, that was the beginning of the push towards Brexit, and that was the beginning of the rise of the far right across the world. And it was the beginning of Trump. So it felt like there was a catastrophic rolling back of human rights in many different countries and cultures and in many different ways, abortion rights, gay rights. And as you say, those were the liberation struggles that I'd grown up in and certainly you'd grown up in. And there was a sense, perhaps a naive sense, that once won, those victories were attained in perpetuity, that they would stay. And that was proving not to be the case. So I think in a state of horror, paranoia and despair that certainly wasn't confined to me alone, but was widely shared, I wanted to turn away from a bombardment of stories about bodies in peril and look back at, first of all, why the body is subject to such violence and such hatred, why the body is considered so dangerous or is needed to be categorized in such violent ways. And then to just work my way through something of the history of liberation over the 20th century to really see, does it mean failure? Does it mean a failure of those movements if they are constantly being rolled back? Or is there a possibility of thinking about them as an ongoing struggle, a struggle that expands beyond any single generation and that people only have to play their part in. That seemed to me a more rewarding way of thinking about it because I think the great danger at the moment, and as you say, the Police Crime and Sentencing Bill is moving through Parliament right now. We are losing further rights. The great danger is that we give way to despair. I was an environmental activist in the 1990s and I experienced activist burnout firsthand and I know that happens to so many people. So I wanted to write something that, while telling rather a pessimistic story about freedom, also is a clear-eyed story about freedom. You don't win something and then let off the balloons and lay back and enjoy a kind of utopia that perhaps Reich fantasised about. The work goes on, the work continues, and if we think about it like that, I think we can do the work with more cheerfulness and hopefulness. Well, I... I don't know if I, I'm interested in that because I, I, maybe we do have to have despair because I think the, 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 the turn to Weimar is a moment of despair and it's a moment of trying to see what kind of forces are raged against us and, or, and so, but I think it's a mistake to miss out on the despair, but I think it's very hard then to know how to organize and gather oneself up collectively to make a political action. I mean, we saw it this year. We're in a moment of renaissance of protest as well. And I think it's just important to remember that, that we take generational positions and it's so clear that that 
happens that a new generation enters into the arena of protest, enters into the arena of resistance and brings new material to it. So Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion would be the two examples that I draw out that feel like they have a totally different experience to the civil rights movement, a totally different set of ways of working, including, of course, the internet as a way of activating and moving protest. But I wouldn't say either that I'm not despairing, <laughs> I'm writing out of despair. I'm writing out of despair, but with the sense that, you know, that line about you're in hell, but you don't give way to absolute desolation, that you continue while understanding that the conditions are perilous and become more perilous by the day. But there's something about just giving way to the sense that you can pull out, as you did in your introduction, the sense that you can pull out infinite bad news stories and then tell yourself that the plight is hopeless feels to me like the wrong way to travel and that by looking backwards, one can become energized and fueled. Yeah, I think that's true. I don't think despair is, is the same as hopeless. And actually, I, I think maybe, I don't think the pictures from Black Lives Matter are so completely different then I was I was at a funeral today and looking and one of the somebody who died who'd been very active in the civil rights movement and very influenced by it. And so there was quite a lot of newsreel footage of that. And I was thinking, OK, they didn't have body cams and we didn't have social media, but the the kind of action in the street was really very compelling and, and very, very similar. And I was thinking about you and your own history in the trees and what you, that then brought to extinction. So it's not, I think there is, there are continuities, they are remade, but they are continuities is I, I guess what I was thinking. Feminism too, that, you know, you must've been struck by this as I was, that the Sarah Everard protests described themselves as a sort of take back the night, reclaim the night. Absolutely. It's slightly different, but basically that 70s moment of feminism that I'm describing is being reenacted right now in our cities in a way that does feel extremely depressing. Yeah, so let's go back to the body because it's, it's a, the way you try to understand or look at you know, I kept sort of thinking, is she doing this? Is she doing that? Is she going this way? Is she going that way? What is she trying? What is she trying to say? Is she speaking into the conversation about othering of bodies so that this group is now excluded? This group, this now fights back. This, I, 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 I want to ask you more about that. Wait, I don't know what you mean. I want to know why bodies was the was your lens because uh -huh. yeah. I think what because I think I could equally you could equally argue it was sex, your your lens was sexuality. You could equally argue that your lens was protest. I mean, there's many ways to argue what So this is a set of ideas about the body. I think what I wanted to do was explore the body in peril in various ways, and then the body as a force for liberation. So following Reich's trajectory completely. So the sick body, the body in illness, this is an experience of bodily vulnerability and bodily interdependence, bodily penetration that most of us experience when I was writing the book, and certainly all of us now are experiencing because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And um, then the sexual body, the way that sex can be seen as a force for liberation, a force for joy, and Reich certainly believes in that, but also, <laughs> sex is a site of extraordinary violence. Sex is a place in which harm is done to people. Sex is a sort of contested site. And I wanted to look first of all at Reich's sort of buoyant, hopeful way of thinking about sexuality. But then even then, even when you're talking about the liberationists in Weimar Berlin, they're eugenicists. They share, they share these ideas. So all, all the way through, you know, each liberation movement I encounter has this sort of shadowy side or has these complexities that show us how complicated freedom is. So then moving on to the early feminists, I wanted to look at sexual violence and what it means to be a body that is the site of violence. You know, as um, Andrew Dworkin says, this soul housed inside a thing, well, Simone Bay, Andrew Dworkin says. What does that mean? What, what does the Sardian vision, the Sardian revel show us about 
the double nature of freedom. Absolute freedom, as Saad shows, is hell for the person who it is being inflicted upon. So I think he gives us this really useful way of thinking about freedom. I demand my freedom. I want the freedom not to wear a mask. I want the freedom not to serve a cake to a gay couple. These sort of freedoms. I want the freedom to protect the unborn child of strangers. Those freedoms are very different from the communal visions of freedoms that liberation movements tend to subscribe to. Then I wanted to look at the boat at the body in prison to have this sense of the ultimate worst fate of a body is losing its liberty is being held and again this is something that Reich's life takes us to but also it's another one of these sort of double-edged sites that the prison has a very strange history with liberation there's ideas of the prison from the 18th century onward as the site of liberation and even somebody like Malcolm X experiences his prison cell not by the intention of the people who are imprisoning him, but by his own wit and ingenuity, experiences the prison cell as a site of liberation. So I wanted to look at that. And then the final section was really about how our communal bodies can affect each other. So protest and performance, these places in which one body can affect another body or many bodies can affect the social structures and the political structures that we inhabit. So, you know, I'm taking very much my own route through both the 20th century and through the subject of freedom and embodiment. And it doesn't look like other people's histories of bodies or freedom because I'm thinking about it differently and I'm taking a different path through it. But it seems to me that these ideas about freedom are not abstract. They come from people's bodies. They're enacted upon people's bodies. And I wanted to think about that history of ideas with real living bodies, with Freud with cancer of the jaw in pain, with Reich sitting in a prison cell and work out what they were trying to say, but also how they came to say it. Were you tempted? I mean, this is a, a kind of side question, but it's it's my particular interest. Were you tempted to, to look at Fanon's work? I was tempted to look at so many different people's work. But I mean, in terms of, of, of of the particular relationship of the incarcerated mind inside of the, the black body. And, and I, I think I've, I've just wondered whether you thought of that. I didn't, no, I heard Malcolm X. Now, the thing is, I mean, the way I work is, it seems like there's an enormous amount of material, but at the same time, it has to cross paths with Reich. It, that's the sort of ruling order of the book. So I required people who had been in the same prison as Reich, who had yeah, been- I thought, that, I mean, it was charming the way you knitted it all together. And it was delightful to learn things I didn't know because my generation of, of therapists and political activists gave up reading Reich after he kind of went nuts is how we thought yeah. about it. So we didn't, yeah. we didn't pursue uh, we just would write it off it a little bit like, oh, yes, aspects of the Russian Revolution kind of went wrong. You know, we had that way of talking about how you get defamations because you can't enact the political revolution, you know, because the state or or the forces against you are just too strong. And we can't, okay, that's what happened to Reich. And of course, it's also what happened to Freud because he becomes far more limited in one way in the scope of his ideas. He gets very, very challenged by, by war, frankly, and by, and by. But also it happens to so many people involved in liberation movements. It happened to Shilameth Firestone. It happens, I mean, it happens to multiple people in the civil rights movement, that sense that you have these goals, you have this sense of hope, fullness at the beginning and then what happens in your wrangling with the state I mean and this is so visible and agonizing in the civil rights movement people are killed people are sent into exile people are imprisoned and the people who are left fall into paranoia and mental illness the same as second generation feminism of course you know so these sort of pitfalls or sh shadow stories of the liberation movements feel very important to me to, to talk about for the generation that's younger than me again, the generation that doesn't know these things or didn't grow up with these things. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because one of the things that's been uh, sort of wonderful in the last five years is to see the presence, the huge presence of Angela Davis again. Yeah. 
not yeah. you know she was working away it's not that she didn't have her difficulties but she's work was working away and making a real particularly a contribution around incarceration you know one of your topics which i think is very very important in a way that you know the the horror of eldridge cleaver etc cetera, etc cetera, kind of had to disappear and it's interesting that, that actually when i wrote the first draft of the book so the first draft was handed in a year before the final and at the beginning the publishers were like what's all this stuff about incarceration we don't really like it why <laughs> angela davis it feels really this is like a 70s story by the time it came to the final draft angela davis and abolition are a thing that everybody is talking about it's a conversation on twitter and it felt like almost as if they hadn't remembered that they hated it at the beginning and were like this more of this this is wonderful and i just think that's so interesting like how things emerge back into the conversation and those people who as you say she's she's been working away about why prison what's the point of prison for decades but now she's talking about it on national news in america in a way that is would have been unthinkable in the 1970s yeah because i was thinking of michael moore's movie when he shows you prison i think in scandinavia and how benign it is and how it's it's uh reformist it is and and that's not what what's being argued about in terms of American prison or British prisons at this point. It's 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 absolutely to to think about this differently as a form of incarceration and all the economic arguments about what the hell those prison communities, why they're situated, where they're situated and the economic power they they produce for the corporates that run them. But yeah. I wanted to ask you something about the whole issue of freedom because I, I think I struggled with this when I finished the book. And I'm not sure I know what you mean by it, and I'm not sure I know what I mean by it, but I think I mean by freedom, and call me old fashioned, something like, on the one hand, extreme complexity of ideas, and on the other hand, justice. Mm. So those are the kind of, pillars for me in mm. in simple terms and i wondered what your pillars of freedom were because i wasn't sure what particularly when you go down the dis, the 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 decide route i mean i'm just not sure what i think you're thinking and I, I i want you to say more i think what i'm trying to do with decide is show how freedom is the concept of freedom, as we chuck it around like a beach ball, is actually many different models of freedom, which we sort of fuse together or sometimes pretend that certain aspects of it aren't there. And I think that model of absolute liberty, to be at absolute liberty to do whatever you want, the, the libertine model of freedom, which these days I think would look like Trump's grabbing by the pussy. That would be <laughs> that would be how the 18th century turns up in the 21st century. Well, yeah. I will do this libidinal act i can do it i'm going to do it i will take it i will take my pleasures where i can rape culture we call it or rape camps we call it so that model of freedom i really wanted to undermine i really wanted to sort of drag it into as andrew dawkins does drag it into the light and say the consequences of this are that you are treating other people's bodies as if they're not real as if they don't matter and as if they don't have a right to freedom so this is where angela carter says my freedom, unless it acknowledges your freedom, makes you more unfree. So that sort of zero sum game of freedom is not the kind of freedom that I'm wishing for. But I think it's very important to look at how that ideal of freedom has been enacted on other people's bodies. So that's part of the project of the book is looking at how that has done damage. But then I think there is clearly another model of freedom, which is the right to inhabit your bodily life without being subject to the multiple rules, repressions, violences that are done because of ideas about what the kind of body you're in is allowed to do. So what the black body is allowed to do, what the woman's body is allowed to do. People who aren't subject to those rules do not often believe that they exist, even if they're continually doing violence to their neighbor's bodies, they turn a blind eye to that. And I think what I wanted to do was call attention to that and show the way in which that runs through all these different liberation movements, gay rights, sexual liberation, women's liberation, 
the civil rights movement that underpins the sense of being able to live more freely inside the body that you have without being subject to these oppressive forces. Sometimes that means changes in the law, and sometimes that means a resistance to the laws that exist. And I am intensely skeptical about there being a better world, there being a utopia in which everybody is free. But what I wanted to end the book with was this idea of imagine it for one moment. You probably aren't going to live in that place, but what would it be like to imagine it? And what sort of structure would we be building if we weren't terrified of each other's bodies? Because I think that's a thought exercise that is to the benefit of all of us. I guess where that sort of, how that affects me is I think, well, yes, I'm with you, but the problem is we've got, we've got incarcerated bodies and incarcerated minds. So mm. of course we, of course, but utopia is a problem. This is, this is why Reich writes the mass psychology of fascism. Well, exactly. And, and every, yeah, sorry, yeah. go on, but yes. Yeah, no, sorry. no, no, and every, every psychoanalytic thinker since is grappling with either on the very, tiniest levels or the biggest levels of the how we how we how we come to be the way we are and mm. and the internal the internal enemies or constraints that we have that are actually quite concrete they're not simply I they are the stuff of our psyches and the stuff of our bodies and this is this is exactly so this again is why Wright was such a crucial figure because this is exactly the fabric of his breach, debate to breach with Freud, that Freud says, we need these structures, we need these structures because we are on some level wild, on some level driven by the death drive, on some level chaotic and imperiled individuals. And Reich has this sort of very touching but naive fantasy that he literally describes it as an onion, that there's a layer of the person that is completely affected by patriarchal capitalism and inside there is the innocent right when we no. don't have that view anymore no nobody has that view i mean everybody has the view that it isn't an onion that you peel off but it's all the way through the structure i'm not sure about nobody i'm not saying i take that view but i i'm not very into sort of blanket statements of how people think i think people think in many different ways no no i'm thinking about my field i'm not thinking about the general what is that is that there's a there's a more nuanced idea that there isn't this thing that has to be repressed and there isn't this thing that you just take the onion layers off it's that the the very extra the how one is how one's invited to into the world location geographic class gendered position parents position parent psyche is going to influence with the way that you're structured so it isn't a this is like thing Catholic. this i mean this is what right brings to psychoanalysis yes. psychoanalysis says yeah, exactly so I, so he he has his own contradictions around onions is all i'm saying yeah absolutely but i mean i i'm not a reikian i'm not saying no, like i get that I'm setting out this, what I think is a fascinating knot at, at the sort of heart of our relationships with our bodies and with our sense of freedom. In a moment where there is a new freedom struggle, I think it's necessary to look back and think what these things actually mean. What, what is it we want? We all know what it would mean to feel less free. We all know what it would mean to feel more free. You know, Fuka comes in with immense skepticism to Reich and says, you know, where is this future where where is the tomorrow where sex will be good again where why has this not happened okay so that hasn't happened but at the same time we have both just talked about the rolling back of liberty so we both know what it means to have less so why can't we know what it means to have more no i'm with you um i, I want to change tack slightly because yeah. <clears throat> you have written a lot about art and you write about art specifically in relation to the body in this book. And I think you've got some slides that you want to show. So I want to give you a chance to talk about them. Oh, sure. And um, yeah, that wasn't how I was gonna do it, but that's fine. Okay, how do you wanna do it? You, no, I was, I'd actually forgotten that I had them, but I was gonna call them in when they sort of felt like they 
bore on the conversation, but why don't we talk about Anna Mendieta? Why don't, I, why don't we look at the Anna Mendietas? Daisy, would you bring up those two images? Daisy is ferreting through her computer. Here they come. And can we see the other one and then go back to this one? Yeah, perfect. So we're having an abstract conversation right now, and that isn't what I wanted to do with this book, that I wanted this book to be grounded in intensely specific examples that felt like they could open up these kind of abstract and in some ways frustrating conversations. So Anna Mendieta was a Cuban American artist who came to America and began to make work, began to make astonishingly mature work after a student was raped on her campus in Iowa. And the first piece she made was called Rape Piece and it reenacted a rape scene. It, she made these works about sexual violence for a few years and then she moved away to making these works, the Silhouettes, which attest to a different level of violence. They're not just, you could look at this, you could read this particular image, as having something to do with sexual violence or something to do with women's lives or something to do with abortion, you could read it like that. But at the same time, they're also very much about the mortal body. They're also about the kind of um, intrinsic texture of violence of human existence, not even human existence, just existence generally. And this one is astonishingly beautiful. Um, and they're about, regeneration as well, they're about repair, they're about the body being part of the earth, they have this sort of eco-feminist aspect to them. And I wanted to talk about Mendieta because in her work, she illuminates these ideas so viscerally and with such subtle, subtlety and power and delicacy, but also her life is completely bound up in the same things that she talked about. She died in her thirties, um, she fell out of a window of an apartment building. The window that she fell out of was much higher than her extremely small body height. And her husband was with her. And her husband, the artist Carl Andre, was found not guilty of her murder, but a question mark has hung over her death. So she's somebody who potentially was the victim of sexual violence. Her work when she when the murder trial was happening was deputized against her as if she had sort of fantasized the death that became her. And she seemed to me, from the moment I first encountered her work, which was in the nineties, we can stop looking at the images now. She seemed to me somebody that was taking a path through a kind of bodily experience that I wanted to follow that they stayed with me in a sort of haunting way for, well, 20 years now. So when I came to write this book, she was absolutely central to it. And was it the images that got you or was it the, was it the images and the story of her? Images, ending? absolutely. The, the images are what I saw first and the images felt like they, the images felt like they attested to something about the body that I believed or experienced on a sort of subliminal or non-articulated level, something about the body as being both solid but dissolving in a state of invisible but perpetual dissolution. So I found them exciting on that level. They, it felt like they made concrete something that I wanted to think more about. And then of course, you hear the story of what happened to her. It's a, it's a story, I think now she's becoming much better known, but it's a story that artists and especially female artists told each other in the nineties. It's a, you know, it's one of those wounding stories that people share. And then it was essential that I wrote about her. So some of the characters in the book came in very late, but she was, along with Reich, she was one of the people who was in the very earliest of the book's dreamings. Okay. <laughs> and there were some other slides you wanted to show, I think. I, I really don't want to. They, that oh, okay. was how I was planning on doing it. I'm fine to bring them in, but there's, I don't want to give... Okay, space. so then let me go back to this idea that I want to... that I'm... kind of want to understand a bit better. 
and maybe this you know, this is my preoccupation I, I i accept olivia but i really am interested in how justice ties up with freedom and how complexity ties up with freedom and what those what those other concepts do to you i, I understand the angela carter quote but can you say any more I feel like we're getting away from what I'm interested in. Okay, well then, I haven't really you... talked about just. I suppose I'm interested in incarceration. I'm well, that's what in... I, I mean. I'm interested yeah. in. I, I, I mean, that's what I mean. Is that is that I'm interested in what freedom means more to you. I feel like I've answered that question. Okay. I feel like we're sort of going down an unprofitable road at this point. I'm, I'm not sure quite what it is that you want me to say that I haven't said. Maybe we want to move. Okay. Point. Let's talk about individualism then, because that's a, a, a real thing that what you do is you follow these individuals in their demise or, and in their struggles, whether it's Bayard Drustin who then reappears and is, is really good, or whether it's Malcolm X who does, who's remade, right, who's not remade, and the, the, the struggle for some kind of new path forward for these individuals that that is just on the edge of their experience or particularly with Reich because I, I, I was just interested in that let's let's turn to somebody different then maybe let's talk about Agnes Martin because that, that okay. feels like somebody who's sort of profitable to um who, whose life very much doesn't fall into those patterns or whose life could fall into those patterns but who refuses it and finds a way of refusing it so what what I wanted to look at in the second half of the book is the way that people evade escape or resist the kind of ideas about the bodies that they inhabit so Agnes Martin is a lesbian artist who absolutely virulently refuses the identity of either lesbian or woman there's this brilliant scene where she's being asked by um an American journalist, you know, how do you feel as a woman artist? And she says, I, I'm not a woman, I'm a doorknob. She's got this sense of just, don't trap me inside these categories. And the reason that I was so drawn to her as an artist is that what she's painting is over and over again, a grid. She's making this six foot by six foot canvas of lines, vertical and horizontal lines, that both feels like an experience of absolute entrapment. You stand up close and you see this grid and you step back. They perform this sort of perceptual sleight of hand. You step back and suddenly you're looking at this radiant, pulsating, glowing open space. And she's offering two sets of possibilities for the same material object. And I think she does the same sleight of hand in her life. She's somebody who is, a gay person in an era of America that was subject to intense state-sponsored homophobia. So here's your question about justice. Um, this is what's known as um, the Lavender Scare, the, the parallel to the Red Scare, which is about communists, but the Lavender Scare is much less well historicized and is about a purge of gay people both within the State Department but also more generally in jobs across America and Agnes Martin is somebody who is subject to that, was subject to that, but also finds canny and idiosyncratic individual responses to that. You can't scale up Agnes Martin, you can't make a manifesto out of Agnes Martin, perhaps you can make a manifesto but you can't make a public policy out of Agnes Martin, it's not going to work. So I wanted to have people like that that worked in completely idiosyncratic ways as well as people like Malcolm X or Nina Simone who are suggesting communal strategies of resistance or ways that social structures can be reorganized because it seems to me we're both, you know this, we're working on both levels at once, we're working communally in social structures and we're working as ourselves in our strange personal universes. Okay, I think we're going to have to go to questions in a minute. Um, I found the whole section on Agnes Martin really fascinating, and also where she ends up with in in that massive isolation on her own, working with her grids. And I was very happy to go and look at the um, pictures of her 
her work. Also, she ends up as a millionaire, which is quite a perverse end to that story. Yeah, well, that was also think. real. But you'd normally think of somebody sort of dropping out and becoming a hermit as, hermit as becoming impoverished, but she doesn't. So the, the whole story takes continual turns away from the expectant. Yeah, I guess it's a per perfect postmodern mo moment. Um, how do you feel about going to some questions now? I feel good about that. Okay, so the first question is, uh, can Olivia talk about the major crisis of global transphobia? I got asked this question last night and my answer is going to be exactly the same. I'm a trans non-binary person and this is what I mean by this grid of ideas that are intensely oppressive to people who are affected by them and invisible to people who aren't. So people who happily identify with woman or man who sit comfortably in that binary and who believe that is biological have this seemingly urgent and unstoppable need to police other people's bodies that don't. They seem on the one hand to believe that this binary is concrete, absolute and perpetual, and yet at the same time, it will be absolutely threatened and fall down if the wrong person is in the wrong bathroom at the wrong time. So the sense that the idea is both fragile and utterly um, epic is, <laughs> absurd, I mean clearly absurd, I illogical, but has real effects again on real people's bodies and it's desperate. It, if we're talking about despair this is the place where I feel real despair. On the one hand people are talking about trans lives in a way that they haven't for a long time, but on the other hand there's it's been weaponized, it's become a sort of artifact in a culture, or it being real trans people's bodies and part of what I wanted to do with this book is just say trans people aren't some eruption of a woke moment that Magnus Hirschfeld in Weimar Berlin in 1920s Berlin was carrying out sex change operations was talking about there being millions of possible genders was doing detailed and intricate questionnaires to find out people's gender identities and saying that there absolutely isn't a sense of two genders so I think it feels important to me to say that these aren't new stories, trans people aren't a new idea or a new invention or something from 21st century culture. They, we have existed forever. I appreciate um, that question. Um, there's a, another a question that's kind of a follow up, but you might not go for it. I'll, I, 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 I'll just, I've just picked it up. Um, the, Karen asked, I know it's the US and not the UK, but does the forthcoming challenge to Roe v. Wade and abortion rights uh, worry you from the point of view of the future of reproductive justice and the idea of women's ownership of their bodies? No, of course it does. Of course it does. And this is, you know, I think this is something that we have been moving towards really throughout my lifetime, which means there wasn't very long that Roe versus Wade felt secure. Susie, do you think that's right? I mean, it feels like from, from the moment it was enshrined in law that it has been gradually chipped and chipped away at. And yeah. the rise of the right over the last um, five, 10 years and the sense that state after state is enacting its own appallingly limiting abortion laws so that there are entire states where you can't possibly have an abortion. Right? the amount of time that you're allowed to have one contracts and contracts, the penalties for abortionists become more and more intense. I think this is one of the most important fights of our time. At the same time, it's interesting that those two questions have come together. I don't think that they don't belong together. I think that you can be an ardent pro-abortion activist and you can also be a pro-trans activist. Those two things are not exclusive and the TERFs who try and say that reproductive struggles don't belong to trans people are just wrong that there can be solidarity and collective activity in both those arenas I think. I, I think what's been one of the more troubling aspects of this for me is the attack on women's pregnancies by various um legislatures in the United States so that you 
I can't remember which ones, but if you require cancer treatment and you are pregnant, yeah, you may not be allowed to have the cancer treatment because it endangers the fetus. Yeah. It's the it's the weighting of the unborn child over the mother. Yeah, and it's and an it extraordinary can... development in I think. Very I don't think we could have anticipated that. I, I think we could anticipate all of the attacks on abortion, but not on maternal health and the fetus being being that has prioritized. Been that has been happening in Ireland for a long time. I know, I know but I somehow had, yeah. did not have yeah. the view that if you had cancer that you wouldn't be treated. I think that was a big shock to me. Yeah. No, again, yeah. This, is a, this is a good and painful question. Yeah. I'm looking for other questions. I actually thought that they, I was going to have some chosen to put before you, but I'm just seeing that there's and loads. you scrolling frantically through. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay, I'll ask you a more personal one. You've talked about how living in a body can feel both imprisoning and liberating. What are the practices and things you do to engage experiences of liberation? Oh, well, it used to be being with other people's bodies, but right now, now it's gardening. <laughs> now it's gardening or drinking wine on my own. I mean, it isn't it, it's so weird to be having these conversations in this in this moment you know to to sort of write something in fairly ardent defense of of our bodily lives and bodily matters and then to be having disembodied conversations and know that there are real people that I believe we are talking to but they don't exist physically in front of me and I think for me it's not that I don't experience liberation through reading or liberation through art or, you know, a sense of enlarging or a sense of the constrictions that bind one loosening, but there really is something about being with other people and being in physical presence. I feel like a different thing happens when you're in a room with somebody. I mean, you're a psychotherapist who has encounters that matter and are charged. Surely those are very different when you're not in physical contact. They are different. very, they are, they're, they're different for some people and it's been very wonderful to go back to the consulting room mm. because not only is there a different charge, but you also have, you don't just have a physical presence in a straightforward way, you have an olfactory presence, you have mm. a moving presence, you don't just have a face. Yeah. You have a whole body. We, we have, have a body that walks into the room. We have had this revelation that our bodies, which we so often believe are just surfaces, are not surfaces. There's so much more that happens in bodily encounter. Again, I like this question. Well, I think for a psychotherapist, one of the things that's been is is very important for me is is therapists rely on something they call countertransference and and which is what gets aroused in them when they're when they're working with an individual or a couple or a family but one of the things I've really loved in my work is what gets aroused in me physically corporeally when mm -hmm. I'm working with people and we don't usually notice that unless there's something sort of a bit off about it or not quite Mm. Uh, and and that's been just a, a a a really interesting development in the work. I mean, over the last twenty years, I'm not talking. And then to come back into the room after having been on Zoom has has been delightful, although nervous making for everybody going back into the room. Actually, and I think we will find that out in in the world as well. I don't think people are. I don't think it's neutral to go back. It wasn't neutral to go away mm. from public spaces in the way that we all had to in COVID. And I think there's enormous amount of nervousness about going back into ordinary conversations that where you can talk over each other and you don't have to be on Zoom where one of you has to stop in order for the next one to talk, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And those are felt both physically and, and emotionally. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting moment that we're now, encountering one another again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I think it's a sh terrible shame for you that you're talking about everybody and, and, and you're not being able to be embodied. Um, I think, Stephanie, you were going to send me some more questions, but I'm now going to scroll down those. Um, artists. Oh, people want to know the artist behind you. <laughs> um, okay, that is David Wonorovich, who is um, one of the central characters in my last book, The Lonely City, my last one fiction book, The Lonely City, and it's painted by Chantal Joffe. Um, and that is a painting by Sagi Mann, who I wrote about in Funny Weather, who was a blind painter. He was a painter who went blind and continued painting. So he's um, an interesting figure, not for many reasons, but particularly how much the end product matters to the artist, how much it matters to not be able to see what you've made, which feels like it should be impossible to be an artist and not be able to know what it is you've produced. And yet, Oliver Sacks writes about that quite a lot, actually, in in some of his where he, where he looks at the neurological loss of seeing and the people who are still painting, and he also looks at what it's like to have lost color. And it's and not then, possible to carry on, which seems sort of astonishing. But yeah, okay, I've got from Adrian alongside the prison abolition movement, the conversation about. Uh, and laws covering recreational drug use has changed radically over the past 20 years. Not in the UK, this person writes, but actually I think it has changed. Listening to you, I'm starting to frame that conversation in terms of what we do with our bodies rather than simply in terms of the law. It's interesting. Uh, of course, this is connected to the incarceration too. Is this part of your thinking at all? Sorry for the long question. That is a brilliant question. It isn't part of my thinking, although I've written about addiction and alcoholism in the past. And now I'm wondering whether it should have been, but interestingly, Maggie Nelson has a new book out called On Freedom, which is set up as four different attacks through the subject of freedom. And one of them is drugs. So that thinking is out there for you to explore quite soon. But I think, yeah, it hadn't occurred to me as sort of available way in. And again, as I say, I, I took a sort of Reichian path and he certainly wasn't going to take any drugs. That's not sort of right act. But the idea of freedom as um, a way of breaking out of the mindset or, well, actually, I mean, I do talk about William Burroughs a lot in the book. So th there is that sense of the vision of freedom or the vision of um, another escape route. So I was talking about Agnes Martin's escape route. Burroughs' escape route is obviously heroin, but Burroughs is also an amazing um, documenter of its um, multiple inadequacies as a route to freedom. So I think that that is actually something that's very interesting to me. It, whatever route out I'm looking at, they all seem to be also a further trap in their own in their own way and Burroughs would be the perfect sort of leak illustrator of that fact. Um, this is from Amaya, thank you. Olivia, how would you situate your work and the stories of the people you talk of in the book and some of your previous work in relation to a stoic understanding of the body as a body that you deal with tolerate in order to have a good life rather than the body you live in and around of and love and hate and so forth. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense to me and it's again an interesting and quite huge question. I think there's so much truth or usefulness in a Stoic's account of the body but I think also I'm really interested in how bodies aren't neutral. Different people's bodies are subject to different forces and the injustice of how those forces fall on different bodies is also very interesting to me and the Stoics account is not necessarily the account of Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, certainly it's not the account of Malcolm X. Martin Luther King perhaps does have something of a Stoicism about him but somebody like Angela Davis or somebody, you know, a Black Panther approach is, is not that at all. It's tear it down, Nina Simone, tear it down. So 
I think Stoicism is, again, it's, it's one of the roots. And it's very much Agnes Martin's root, just live inside the body, tolerate the body's discomforts and turn your mind away from bodily matters to the abstract values of but that isn't the kind of thing that's lit a flame under liberation movement so there are other sets of possibilities that I've explored as well yeah um I think you've answered the, there's a book about your pro there's a question about your process but I actually I don't know if you want to answer a book about your process because you already alluded to the fact that um Okay, I'm looking. Um, okay, I think this will go to your heart, but not with this book. You use the phrase, the phrase ecofeminism, and where's a good place to start reading about this topic? Oh God. <laughs> This really is. I mean, in some ways, I've sort of keep thinking that this book could be subtitled my 1990s and yeah, you know, exactly. university in the 1990s. So I'm really uh, brought up in ecofeminism. But the problem with ecofeminism is it's a biological, often it's a biological model of feminism that now feels very difficult to square with trans identities. So, I mean, something like Susan Griffin's The um, Woman and Nature is in some ways an extraordinary book, but also a book that I feel like is dated in various ways. I, one of the things that I've tried to do in this book is, is bring up people who are complex and whose ideas contain ideas that are no longer fashionable or no longer valid, but also who have other things in them that are liberating and interesting. And I think that book would fit into that category. It feels very old fashioned, but also like it hops to a lot of truths it feels it feels important um i still have it in my library mary daly again who me too <laughs> yeah and i mean now she's a trans exclusionary radical feminist but nonetheless i i came up on mary daly and i think a lot of her writing is really interesting and also it is okay for us to read things that we don't agree with it, that feels really important to me that we can read things and think well that aspect is loathsome and that aspect is useful to me that the sort of pragmatic approach to Culture is much more my path than casting things aside and cancelling works. I'm, I'm not a participant in that particular game. Okay, this is probably the last question. Um, um, this is from Isabel. The scope of topics covered tonight has been broad and fascinating. Thank you. To focus on an issue that I think touches on what's been discussed, what are your thoughts about the way sexual violence in prisons is presented in popular culture? Oh my God, that is a good question. It is, isn't it? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, and I'm imagining that you're thinking about things like Orange is the New Black. The whole, the whole um, representation of sexual violence and especially violence done to women's bodies for, um, you know, um, commercial pleasure, the, the sort of Handmaid's Tale, not the book, but the TV series, sort of torture porn version of what happens to people's bodies. You know, they used as a justification, well, all of these things that are done to women's bodies in our show were done to real women's bodies, therefore this is kind of activism. It isn't activism. It's a way of making yourself feel stunned with the hells that are performed on other people's bodies. And I personally, it's, it's not for me. I, I find it objectionable and I think if you're interested in prison then reading real testimony, reading Albert Woodfox, reading people's stories of what happens to them feels a lot more useful than watching it as a sort of way to sneak a glimpse at abject bodies, that that feels kind of repellent I think. I'm, I'm really yeah, I think that's a really, really good and important question. Well, they all have been, they've been wonderful questions. Um, okay, there's one last question I'm gonna ask, just because I'm sure everybody wants to know what you're reading next. So this question really gets to, to it. Rebecca says, your text seems wide ranging and a testament to critical engagement as well as intellectual curiosity. Are there other figures 
or bodies that you wanted to include? Oh, I mean, I went back to the proposal and I had so many people in it that didn't fit in. I had Pee Wee Herman in it. I just feel really mournful that Pee Wee Herman didn't make it through. You know, he was that sort of um, very interesting childlike star who was caught masturbating in a porn cinema and cancelled before cancelling really became a thing. And I was really interested in digging into Pee Wee Herman. Um, now I can't think who else, but th there's always a long list. Ryan Tricartin, the um, sort of internet era filmmaker, I was really interested in writing about. There's always a long list of people. And then as I find the through line, they don't have enough crossing points with the mainstream of narrative, so they, they can't fit. And I mean, Frank O'Hara, I've tried to put in every book I've ever written and I always fail. So yeah, there are definitely characters around that didn't squeeze through the door. Okay, so now I think now I think we have to stop because we're running out of time. Is there anything else you want to say to us? <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Thank you to you, Susie, and thank you to everyone who's been here. It's it's just it feels like such a luxury to get to talk at the moment and to have sort of robust conversation, and I'm very, very appreciative of it. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I know everybody will really want to read the book who hasn't read it already because it's a hell of a good read and it will keep you company for a long time when you read it because it's really meaty and yet it's written so beautifully you don't realize quite how much you're taking on it's fabulous thank you olivia thank you thank you very much okay all right thank you so much susie and olivia for this really rich engaging a very lively conversation covering such a broad range of subjects for us this evening and taking so much care and thought in your answers and we just want to remind everyone that the books are available from you and bookshop and they have signed copies of everybody by olivia lang which is out now and we urge you all to pick up a copy and um, enjoy more of these stories and these artists um, and discover more about the history of ideas, protest, freedom, and gender. And we just want to say a huge thank you to you all for your fantastic questions and for being part of this evening's event. And thank you, Susie, for your fantastic interview. And we will see you all again soon. Good night. <laughs>